You plug in the numbers, right? One over one over six, bada bing, bada boom, you get the correct answer of six. Now the interviewer says, good, good, but, but, and that's a big but. How many times must a fair die be thrown until a six is obtained? Now, if we just list out the probabilities of a fair die on the right, and if you don't know this, well, good luck to you. So let's, let's let this number be X, right? Let, let the number of times, the number of rows needed until a six is obtained, let this number be X. Now, how would X look like? X could be equal to 1, you roll the first try, you get a 6. X could be equal to 2, you roll the second try, you get a 6. And then the first try, you don't get a 6. And to, and to those of you who can count that high, X could even be 5. Wow. Right? A 6 on the last 5th row, and the first 4 rows, you don't get a 6. And so on and so forth. So X could be really small, 1 or 2. X could even be really large, like 6 or 7 or 8. God knows how high. So clearly, X is a random variable. Now, what type of random variable is the next question? Let's see. On each roll of the dice, we have two outcomes, right? It's either we get a six or we don't get a six, right? Two outcomes of interest to us. We either roll a six or we don't get a six. Therefore, the outcomes are binary. And each of these rows, they are independent. One row does not affect the probabilities of the other. So the first row, getting a one on the first row does not affect your ability to get a six and the third or fourth or fifth or how many rows down the line, so they are independent rows. Next, the probabilities of the outcome on each row stay constant. So, that is to say, whether you are on the 5th or the 6th row, it doesn't matter. The outcomes will always be this table, right? They're not going to change. It's not going to be on the 6th row, 1. The probability of getting 1 is suddenly like 2 out of 6 or something like that. So, the probabilities stay constant. Now, there's also no fixed number of trials or fixed number of rows. So we could roll one, we could roll twice, we could roll three times, four times, as we've seen in the diagram in the previous slide. So given that this description of the problem satisfies the, f the, the few criteria here, what we can say is that it is a geometric. X is a geometric random variable. It's clearly geometric in nature. Now, those of you who remember your introduction to probability will say, ah, I remember the formula for uh, the expectation of a geometric random variable. The expectation of X, a geometric random variable, is one over the probability of success. Let's call it one over P. In this case, it's probability of rolling a six. Therefore, you plug in the numbers, right? One over one over six, bada bing, bada boom, you get the correct answer of six. Now, the interviewer says, good, good, but, but, and that's a big but, Let's not rush this and let's start from the basics. Begin from the definition of expectation of a discrete random variable. So what is it? And you might perhaps say, fuck, look, I get it. Preparing for quantity views is tiring, doing hours of practice questions. So why not take a break from this question to learn about my recent experience interviewing in London and in the EU so you don't repeat my mistakes by clicking the link on the top right. And now, back to the question. Beginning from the definition of the expectation of a discrete random variable shown on the bottom left, where the expectation of x is equal to the sum of some product, right? And these products are for each term. For each possible value of x, it is a product of this value of x and the multiplied by the probability of this value of x occurring. So let's say it's one, let's say we have one row, one multiplied by the probability of getting one, of x being one row needed to get a six. And the sum of all these products, let's say sum to n terms, will be the expected value of x, assuming that there are n outcomes for this random variable x. So at this point now, okay, great, bro. How are we going to get from the left to the right, how are we going to reduce this left hand side down to this really neat one over probability of success equals to six? Now, come down, we'll get there, we'll get there. So, let's once again go back to the possible values of x. Let's just take a deeper dive in this. So, what's the first possible value of x? Right, the the the, the possible values of the, the number of rows needed to get a six. Well, it can't be zero, clearly, it can't be negative rows. So, 
has to be 1. We roll it once and we get a 6. And the probability of this occurring, the probability of the random variable x being 1, is 1 over 6, because that's the probability of getting a 6 on a fair die. Now it could be 2, right? So we don't roll a 6 on the first try, and then we roll a 6 on the second row. So the probability of that occurring is 5 over 6 times 1 over 6, because 5 over 6 is the probability of rolling the other 5 numbers that are not 6. It could be 3. Similarly, you roll two numbers that are not a 6, and then we roll a 6. So it's 5 over 6 times 5 over 6 times 1 over 6. It is the products of these individual events because they are independent trials. Could be 4. Wow, you know, amazing. It's, so it's 5 over 6, 5 over 6, 5 over 6 times 1 over 6 as the probability of having 4 rows before we get a 6. So, and so on and so forth. So at this point, just let's look at the pattern, right? So what we have is x equals to 1, and then we have you know, 1 over 6, right? Now, when we have x equals to 2, so 2 rows, we have 1 of these 5 over 6 terms. And we, when we have x equals to 3, we have 2 of these 5 over, 5 over 6 terms. And then we have 4, so 4 rows in total, we have 3 of these 5 over 6 terms. So if you want to generalize this, we can say that the number of these 5 over 6 terms that will occur is simply the number of rows that we will see. So let's say we let's call it n. It's n minus 1. So it's n minus 1 of these 5 over 6 terms, and then just it's always 1 of these 1 over 6 terms, right? So let's see how it plays out. So if we just go to some hypothetical n number of rows, what we get is the following. As discussed, 5 over 6 to the power of n minus 1, because those are the number of 5 over 6 terms that will occur, times 1 over 6 for the 6 that appears on the final row. So how does this look like when we place it into our formula? So we know it's just the product of a outcome of x times the probability of it occurring. So the first term is simply x multiplied, so 1 multiplied by 1 over 6, which you get the first term, 2 multiplied by this term, 3 multiplied by this term, which gives us these two terms, and then so on and so forth. And then for the n term, it's just n multiplied by this bad boy over here, and we get this summation. Great. At this point, to make it more simple, to make the numbers less hairy to deal with, let p, the probability of success, so getting one, getting 6 on the dice roll, be 1 over 6, and q b equals to 5 over 6, and due to laws of total probability, because there's only two outcomes here, p is just 1 minus q, as we can see. So simplifying our equation, we get the following. 1 times b plus 2 times q times b plus blah 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 blah. Simplifying it further, we get the following um, sum of terms. Now, some of you might realize, oh, this looks a little bit like uh, you know, some sort of uh, geometric series, right? And you are somewhat correct. So taking a closer look, we have we now have the expectation is the expectation of x is just equals to p plus two q plus p plus three q squared plus p, right? But is it a series though? So let's see. Okay, we have some sort of starting term. We have you can see that between each individual term, we have the terms being scaled by a value q, right? Because q is increasing with each term, and then it will go to q, q, q4, blah, blah, blah. But then we also have this, you know, let's say 2 and the 3. Technically, there's a 1 here. There's a, there's a hidden 1, right? 1, 2, 3. So it's almost, it kind of looks like an arithmetic series as well, where each term is increasing by a constant value, and it's also similar to a geometric term, where each term is, each successive term is being scaled by some scaling factor q, right? In this case. So, what is it? Now bear with me here while I do some magic. Let's take this equation, the expectation of x, and then we multiply it by q. And say, whoa, 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 what are you doing? So bear with me, okay? This will all work out in the end. So let's just multiply this equation by the, a constant q. So what do we get? We get the following, q times the equation above and reducing it down, we get qp plus 2q squared, blah, 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 and say, wow, shit. Dude, this is even worse. How does this help us solve the problem? I say, okay, here's the next step. Now we have Q, 
e so q times the expectation of x right so the next step is to do expectation of x minus this q times expectation of x and see and now you're thinking though you're making it worse bro stop but don't worry it, it, it will the numbers will flush out in the end so doing that what do we have we have just the you know our equation from before minus the equation from above and if you can see so this p term we can just put it here and then these terms here 2qp minus qp is just we just get a qp and then similarly 3q squared p minus 2q squared p we get q squared p and so on and so forth so let's see how that works out we get the following so it's p plus qp plus qp squared uh, plus q squared p plus uh, q q b okay it's confusing yeah i know i know come down now what do we have okay let's take a closer look right we we, we knew that okay we have some sort of arithmetic and geometric series we do we we take the q multiply by the by the by the expectation and we subtract it again a lot of steps but let's take a look okay so we have a first term p and now each successive term is just scaled by q right so we multiply by q another q and then another q and then so on and so forth so what we have now is a geometric series and this geometric series sums to some number that's this is called n right because we had n terms so what we have after doing all that mumbo jumbo is a geometric series that sums to n to n terms right where n is some really large number so those of you who remember the finite sum of a geometric series, as shown on the top right, is equals to a1, so the first term, in this case, our first term, to those of you who can't see, is just p. And r, being our common ratio, so what's the common ratio between each successive term, is simply just q. So r, in this case, is equals to q, and a1 is equals to p. Great. So, plugging in the equations, we get p times 1 minus q to the power of n this entire thing divided by 1 minus q okay great but now we're stuck with the problem of q i mean uh, with the problem of n so n we know goes to, can go to a ridiculously large number right because you could roll i don't know let's say a thousand times and then on 999 you don't get a six and then on the thousand row you get a six so you can be a large number so this large number n goes to positive infinity infinitesimally large so let's just substitute that in so now it's a sum to an infinite number of terms and if you remember p equals 1 over 6 and q equals 5 over 6 both these numbers are less than 1 right 1 over 6 5 over 6 they are both less than 1 okay now so let's think about this q term here so q, q is a number that's less than 1, and we are raising this number to a really, really, really large number. So if you think q, this number is 0 0.83 something, right? So let's just call it 0 0.8, right? So if you think 0 0.8 times any uh, number x, x gets smaller. So if you take this scaling factor that makes a number smaller, times it by an already small number, and then we just repeat this an infinite number of times, it gets smaller, 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 smaller. To what does this term go to? If, we te if it tends to infinity, it goes to zero. So what do we have next? We get p times 1 minus 0 over 1 minus q, which gives us p over 1 minus q, which so happens to be the formula for an infinite sum of a geometric series given, and I didn't add this in, given that r is less than zero. So r is less than you know, less than one, right? So we make sure that the term that this term here, this term here, this gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it goes to zero, and then it, this just reduces down to this. So great. So p over one minus q. Okay, great. How does that help us? But remember, one minus q is just the same as p. So p over p equals to one. Yay! Great. Looks neat, right? This entire series sums to one. So how do we, how does this help us? Let's remember how we got this series. This series is the difference between the expected value of x and q times expected value of x. Let's put that back. back. Let, let, let's put that back in. 
And then I think now you can see the magic happening. Doing some rearranging, expected value of x equals to one over minus, uh, one over one minus q. And as we discussed in the previous slide, one over one minus q is just equals to p. And p is equals to one over six. And therefore we got our answer. At this point, your interviewer silently nods his head in approval. And he says, great. Now for your next question, click the video on the right.